is an wildlife photographer. Um, he is also an incredible writer and a published author, birding guide, and overall conservation advocate from Trinidad and Tobago. His love of the natural world began as a child, and he also, um, within his adult life, went through electrical engineering as his background before really pouring all of his efforts into birds and getting people excited about the natural world. So I'm really grateful to have him here with us today. And I will pass it over to him for him to be able to really share his love of birds and share more about how we can all help them. Um, before I do that, I did want to ask for everyone to please feel free to drop questions within the chat. And we'll also make room for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but we're gonna do our best to just let him focus on all of his amazing photography and stories. And we will get to those questions at the end. So thank you for your patience. And um, yeah, I'll pass it to you now, Faraz. Okay, thank you, Alicia. And thank you uh, for, for at, uh, Venture Audubon and Vince and Cynthia and all of your team. Um, so what I'll do, and hi everyone, of course, and it is a real pleasure to um, to be able to share some of my images and uh, and stories with you. All right, so you all should be seeing um, my screen, and this is um, this is a little showcase of the rich avifauna found in my country of Trinidad and Tobago, and. Uh, it's it's entitled Building the Wildest Islands of the Caribbean. And you might be wondering why. It's a really um I'm really might be beside myself to have to title this thing like this, but I'm sure you're gonna figure it out. And I'll tell you why we are really and truly um the wildest islands of the Caribbean. Um so just to start off, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I know we all wanna get into the birds. And I know we all want to get into um, all of these things that we've came here for, right? So just just a brief thing, um, why the wildest islands of the Caribbean? So here we can see the, the Caribbean island chain, um, starting with Cuba in the, the very, very top left, and snaking all the way down and just to the bottom here on the bottom right is Trinidad and Tobago. And the light blue area, if you all can see properly, that light blue area is, um, that represents the South American continental shelf, which is a really crucial detail um, in, and a really crucial factor in our biodiversity. Okay, so yes, we are part of the Caribbean technically, but we are also sitting right on that continental shelf, that South American continental shelf. So I like to call Trinidad and Tobago um, continental islands. All right, so just um, a closer view of these two islands. So I just want you to take, I don't know how well you all can see this, um, but um, there are three main mountain ranges on Trinidad, and you can see it by some of the textures um, on the map. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse pointer, you should be able to, um, but just on the top of the island of Trinidad here is, um, is a northern range. And there is one in the middle, guess what? That's called the central range. And there is a little one on the bottom here, and that is, you no know, surprises here, that's called the Southern Range. Um, on Tobago, there is one main mountain range uh, called the Main Ridge. And I tell you these things because the mountains really, um, they govern our weather and they govern our little climate in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. And you can see at the very left of this map and at the bottom left, there is Venezuela, that is mainland South America. and. Uh, yeah, we have we have a lot of um, South American fauna here, uh, and this is really and truly because we are fairly recent uh, in terms of being being islands, right? Only relatively recently in terms of geological um, in the, in the geological time, um, just at the end of the last ice age, maybe just about ten or eleven thousand years ago, we separated from 
the mainland. So we've had a lot of um, fauna and flora from mainland South America. We also had a lot of prehistoric megafauna like uh, giant sloths and um, glyptodons. You all know glyptodons. Those are the giant armadillos. They found fossils of those um, on Trinidad fairly recently. And all of the, the mountain ranges that I told you uh, were forested. And most of the lowland areas were savannas. And these were, for the most part, wet savannas, right? Um, and wet savannas, we'll get into that a little bit a little bit later on. Um, after the Ice Age, uh, with, the, with the warming climate, most of these wet savannas uh, gave way to forest. And the, the mountain ranges on both Trinidad and Tobago, as I said, they determine our rainfall. And something else that determines the rainfall is the general direction of the prevailing winds. And these all come from mostly from the northeast. So you'll find that the northeast corner of each island is the one that has the majority of the rainfall and then you know it 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 differs across the island each island that is but for the most part as a general rule the northeast of both islands have um have the the majority of the rainfall but a combination of the type of soil as well as the the lay of the land as we say um gives rise to many different kinds of habitats Right, so we have a variety of habitats, and these all in turn lend to the high level of biodiversity, right? And yeah, we're here to talk about the birds, right? And you know, I just had um, I don't have the book with me right now, but I have uh, several of my images published in the Birds of the Lesser Antilles. Um, these. This Birds of the Lesser Antilles, as well as books like Birds of the West Indies, um, by I think Birds of the West Indies was done by the original James Bond, um, which is another story altogether. But we have so many birds here that these other publications deliberately omit Trinidad and Tobago because you know there are about 500 birds in the wider Caribbean and. Uh, our latest tally is 492 species and spread over a surface area of five, just over 5,000 square kilometers, which I'm not sure how much it is in, in miles, in square miles, I'm sorry. Um, but it gives us the, the second highest species density of, uh, of birds on the world. So that's interesting. And uh, many of these many of these birds breed on Trinidad uh, as well as on Tobago. So that's more than 250 on Trinidad and about 100 on Tobago. Breeding, of course, is tied to availability of food, which uh, is in turn linked to trends um, of rainfall. And in addition to these breeding birds and these resident birds, we also have a lot of migratory birds. And remember our our position on the on the at just at the bottom of the Caribbean islands, um, that is really and truly the majority of uh, of birds that fly from North America into South America. That Atlantic Flyway. Um, we we are uh, generally see we generally see most of those uh, once they once they're heading to South America. A lot of them pass through Trinidad and Tobago. So we get boreal migrants, we also get austral migrants, so migrants from the south escaping the southern winter. So some of these birds may be living in South America, and with the southern winter, they move uh, northward, and they also touch us. Um, we also get sometimes wanderers from across the Atlantic. In the Caribbean, for the most part, um, the island of Barbados being the most uh, easterly island, they tend to get a lot of the, the wanderers from across the Atlantic. They have a population of little egrets, they have grey herons and so on there. We also get these birds, but not as um, as, as common. Um, but for the most part, the uh, birds are, well, yeah, they're evenly distributed across all habitats. There's no way that you can go, whether it's here on Trinidad and Tobago or anywhere in the world, really, where there are absolutely no birds, right? 
they're everywhere and that's why we love them and that's why they're so charismatic so anyhow what i'm going to do um for for this talk is that i'm going to give you a, a virtual tour of the islands of trinidad and tobago okay so we're going to start in the southwest of trinidad and we are going to gradually move our way through different habitats on trinidad and then on tobago so we're going to start at one corner of one island and we're going to end up uh, at the other corner of the other island and if we're doing this in person it might not take an hour it might take a little bit longer than that but um but hey let's um let's go and see some birds okay so yeah on the on the southwest of trinidad on that that southwestern tip on that peninsula we have a mix of coconut plantations and and wetlands if you ever come i'll take you and you see how um, coconut uh, coconut oil is made and it's really it's really interesting process so for each site i'm going to show you let's just say five birds that can be found here and don't worry you don't have to id them because i've already done that for you and um and yeah i'm not going to spend too much time on the species but i'm just going to show you that these are some of the some of the incredible birds that that we can that can be seen in these areas right so um here we have you I, i'm not sure if you get a yellow headed blackbird in the in the western us but we have a very similar one yellow hooded blackbird um white-headed marsh tyrant that's also that's a flycatcher um we have uh, several species of ducks, uh, as well as raptors. The rufous crab hawk, I'll tell you, the, the first time I saw this species, it's not one of the, the birds that we see pretty often here, but the first time I saw it after looking for it for a long time, it was perched on this coconut tree. This is from my first sighting. Um, it was on a coconut palm tree directly over a sign that said crabs for sale. So maybe it knew something that I didn't. Um, in the Southwest Peninsula, we have, you know, there are, there are wetlands, um, there, we have freshwater lagoons and these mix with the ocean. So it's some really nice brackish habitat and we get, um, a bunch of very, very interesting birds on the left, leftmost slide is a, a cocoi heron. That's one of the largest, um, herons we have here. You all would I'm sure be familiar with the great blue heron. The cocoi is arguably around the same size maybe a little bit larger but it is a that quintessential large south american heron uh, we have muscovy ducks here as well as well as uh the collared plover which um i don't know is it is is the jury still out on plover versus plover i'm not sure but either way the collared plover is a tropical plover and um it is it is the smallest one that is resident in Trinidad and Tobago. The bird on the on the right, extreme right, the yellow chin spine tail, is one of three spine tails, and it's it, it's an interesting uh, group of birds. They they belong to the oven bird family, and there's a funny thing about Trinidad and Tobago is that we have a, a motif of uh, birds that come in threes. So the yellow chin spine tail is one of three spine tail species that is found here and we there, there are several other threes that that we would um that we would encounter for those of you all i also write for a blog Ten Thousand birds and in that blog i've i've spoken extensively on the on these um these triads as i like to call them anyhow moving on and I hope I'm not going too quickly, but we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, this south, the southern coast of Trinidad um, is so. Just remember, just picture, picture the islands. We're heading westward, but we're staying on the southern coast, right? And this southern coast, if you remember where the mainland is, right, um, the Orinoco River um, comes out. It empties into the ocean. And the current takes it straight along the southern coast of Trinidad. So 
there's first of all there's a lot of erosion happening here as you can see the ocean is reclaiming our parts of this forest and second of all here we get a lot a lot of debris washing up from south america so walking here it's you know it's it's easy to see unfortunately the the easiest thing to see from south america that came down the river is uh plastic plastic waste but um we also get these huge rafts of floating vegetation especially when there's a lot of rain on the mainland we get huge rafts of, of floating vegetation and these rafts can be uh, any size and some of them can contain um wildlife as well um a tapir came came up once um anacondas well, we have anacondas as well as a native species of snake um but yeah we get some interesting interesting wildlife here and here i think we should get some of uh some species that are or at least one species that is familiar to some of you uh and that's the osprey and uh, the osprey of course is uh, a migrant to trinidad and tobago interesting fact about that bird is that they don't breed here uh, some of these ospreys would stay around for the entire year but they would be um, young birds generally in their first year and once they get to maturity they head to north america to breed um so yeah i it's it's funny here that the spotted toady flycatcher is the largest uh, bird that it, it appears to be uh, it's, it's it appears to be the largest bird here um but it's actually the smallest and it's probably only about a couple inches tall and i believe it measures maybe just uh four inches from tip to tip um another another really interesting bird here is a hook-billed kite and it is uh it is a an interesting uh, interestingly adapted bird especially um, made to feed on snails um in the forest so they they hunt these um special snails that are found um, on trees that they're you know they're on the branches and so on so they and they have a very strongly hooked bill that they prize them open with an interesting thing about this bird as well is that throughout its range it's distributed throughout um much of the the neotropics the degree of 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 hook in a hook billed kite varies um depending on um on the habitat and depending on the prey that it feeds on you know which species of snail and so on anyhow um so we're moving from the southern coast of trinidad up onto the northern part of that peninsula right so the northern coastline of this southwest peninsula is uh is 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 different and it's different because the ocean is different so if you're looking uh at this picture just in the lower center part you're, you're going to see um, a little bit of the of the sea that sea is is called the gulf of paria and the gulf of paria is the body of water that is um, between trinidad and venezuela uh, on the western side of trinidad um, and the eastern side of venezuela so it's 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 a really really nice sheltered area and in times gone past it was uh, a carving ground for various species of whales sadly um there was also a whaling station um, along in, on some of the, the offshore islands of Trinidad. And that, I don't have to tell you how that ended. There are no whales there anymore. So some of these birds are very possible to see. And on, on, this, um, on this peninsula, and I don't think the bird on the left needs any introduction but many people have never seen one in the wild and here is a wonderful place that you can come and see wild free-flying blue and yellow macaws All right we also have common a bunch of different tunes we have common tunes we have roseate tunes um we had one arctic tune that showed up and that was really interesting um just a few years ago that was a gecko in case you heard that um that's our that's our neighbor 
Uh, the banana quit is a very, very ubiquitous bird here. Um, they're everywhere. They're always twittering in the forest. And uh, they, it's sometimes, you know, I call it, you know, I'm sorry. I sometimes call it the bird of false hope. Not to offend the banana quit, but, you know, in warbler season, when you're looking up in the canopy and you, that warbler neck is just setting in and you're looking for, you're looking for migratory warblers and then you see a little bird flitting about um most often it's a banana quit um but they are gorgeous birds they are lovely little ones and um for many years people didn't know where to put the banana quit in the taxonomy they weren't sure if it was a warbler or they weren't sure if it was a tanager or whatever now it's in the tanager family and it's an incredible little bird with um i believe just about 41 subspecies so Hey, who knows in a few years, maybe there'll be different species of banana quits, but time will tell, right? Um, anyway, moving a little bit east, but still in that um, southwest area, there is a, a lot of marshland in, in the southwest. And uh, it's, this marshland is interspersed with scrub vegetation, so isolated. Um, patches of trees and so on and this area is actually one of the the best places to find all three species of bitterns remember i told you that um i told you that we have three species of many different um, families of birds bitterns um, is one of them and on the left here you can see the largest one which is a pinnated bittern uh, and it's a really really um, imposing character but they love to stand with their with their heads straight up so you don't ever see them. Um, and uh, hey, next to that is a white-tailed golden throat. It's our first hummingbird of the trip. And it's a really interesting hummingbird too because it is not found in, in the forest. You know, you, you see a lot of these lodges uh, in the neotropics and um, people who photograph hummingbirds, you know, they take videos of hummingbirds at the feeders and it's also so verdant and uh, it's it's in the rainforest the white-tailed golden throat is a very very different hummingbird because it does not inhabit that kind of habitat at all they love these wide open areas they love wetlands they love scrub and um, they are truly a bird of open country um, next to that the mast yellow throat is uh is one of our three species of resident warblers so that's um, closely related to the common yellow throat that's found in the US. I don't know if you get it in the West, um, but it is. It has a it has a beautiful song as well. Um, next to that is a dixisel, which is a migratory bird and what we call an eruptive visitor to Trinidad. Um, it's not found on Tobago. So when I say eruptive, meaning that some years we have a whole lot of them, and I'm talking about tens of thousands. I believe there's been a record in the past of 200,000 dick sisters at some point, and other years we get none. So it's, it's an interesting bird, as all birds are, right? And as I've been speaking about all of them, on our extreme right is our purple gallinule, which is a fairly common resident of this kind of habitat on both islands, Trinidad and Tobago. So heading straight across now, still in the south, but we're heading straight across to the southeast. And I told you about this uh, southern range, right? The southern uh, mountain range that we have. Uh, this southern range is also known as the Trinity Hills. Right, it was rumored that you know the person who was uh, lost at sea and and happened upon um, land masses um, several hundred years ago um, saw three hills jutting up from the ocean, and these three hills were eventually called the Trinity Hills. And this is a um, relatively inaccessible forest, and it is the last remaining virgin lowland forest on the island of Trinidad. And it's, it's a really, really unique mix of, of habitat. And some of the birds that you can't find here, uh, you know, it's, it's a mix of forest birds and water birds. So 
on our left, we have a scaled pigeon, which is a really, really large pigeon, gorgeous bird. And uh, next to that is a rufescent tiger heron. And this is a young, a young bird. This is a juvenile bird. As with all tiger herons, they are they only have the orange and black stripes when they're juveniles. As they become adults, they lose the stripes. And in in the case of the rufescent tiger heron, they take on this really, really um rich sort of um rusty red color um next to that is a streak synops one of my favorite birds i don't have a favorite bird i love all of them um but that streak synops is it's it's got one of those upturned bills because it likes to to dig in and prize open um loose bark and so on so they love dead trees as this one is on a dying bow so moving a little northward now um, to central Trinidad. So I hope that everyone was paying attention when we were when we had that map up on the screen. So you so you can still visualize where we're going. So we took the south already. We're done with the south, and we're heading a little bit north. All right. So much of this um, the area in central Trinidad is drained by um, uh, a really really um, intricate network of rivers. And many of these rivers lead to the uh, Karuni Swamp on the western coast. And the Karuni Swamp is the second largest wetland on the island of Trinidad. And the Karuni Swamp enters, empties, sorry, into the Gulf of Paria. The Gulf of Paria is that body of water to the west of Trinidad. Some of the incredible birds that you can see in the Caroni Swamp include, guess what, the Scarlet Ibis. Um, I believe you all have um, shared some of uh, my images um, prior to this talk, and one of them was of a Scarlet Ibis. And that one actually was um, on the mud flats of Western Trinidad, which we'll get to shortly. But uh, within the Caroni Swamp is one of the best areas to see this bird. and you know, every year for our Christmas bird counts, we do, uh, we try to, to count them. And personally, I've never been tasked with the responsibility to count the Scarlet Ibis. And I'm really happy about that because they can number maybe like four to 5,000 sometimes, sometimes more than that. So, you know, listen, I have been a musician for many years and sometimes counting to four um is a problem so uh so i'm definitely not counting to a few thousand and uh, the straight billed wood creeper is an interesting wood creeper because it's only found in the in the mangrove areas on the west coast of trinidad there are mangrove swamps on the eastern side of trinidad as well but there the, there is there is a uh, a difference in the nature of the mangrove swamps there versus the mangrove swamps on the on the west so the straight build wood creeper is very aware of the differences and is only found on the western side. Um, on the extreme right, we have a, a pair of green-throated mango. And these are these are fairly large hummingbirds as well, and they they love mangrove uh, swamps. They're also found in in forested areas, but yeah, they love feeding on uh, mangrove flowers. Uh, just to the left of that is a mast cardinal, which is not actually uh, a cardinal, but it's a tanager. Um, just another uh, bird nerd fact for you. So yeah, I was talking about the mudflats, right? And uh, on these mudflats, they are they are fairly extensive and historically they have um the the entire west coast of trinidad where most of the west coast of trinidad was uh, made up of this um these mudflats um before many many years ago um this this whole area was the formed part of the orinoco river delta and this is simply a, a remnant of that so for the eagle-eyed among you, um, you can try to pick out the species that are in this um, photograph. Um, of course, on the 
the pink birds here are American flamingos. There's to the right of the flamingos, there's a brown pelican. And I believe you would also have brown pelicans there. And there are some uh, smaller sandpipers on um, on the floor, just among in and among the, the feet of the flamingos. And behind we have a few egrets, uh, as well as roosting gulls and terns and so on, but I'm not gonna have you ID blobs. That's That's my responsibility, right? So some of the birds that are in um, in and around this area include um, some that are resident and some that are migratory. So we have uh, migratory birds like the willet. I absolutely love them, especially when they're when they're flying. I saw one just a few weeks ago here in Tobago that was still in its breeding plumage, and that was really exciting because I'd never seen that before. This one. Um, in the in the photograph here is in non-breeding plumage, but um, but yeah, it's they only they only in their breeding dress for a very short time. As soon as they arrive here and they're spending the winter here, they change their clothes. You know, they get home and they change their clothes. Um, another one of our interesting migrants is a black and white warbler, which is a, a warbler that would that moves very much like a wood creeper or a tree creeper, I think. Moving a little bit uh, more into the middle of the island of Trinidad, we would find uh, a lot of scrub habitat in the in the lowland uh, low lying areas. Now, the scrub habitat is very much like the, I think, like prairies in the U.S. And in a similar way, it's the the importance of these habitats have been overlooked, right? So it's just like, hey, this is accessible land. It doesn't have much tree cover, so let's use it for something else. And a lot of times to detrimental effect, right? But as with every single habitat, there is a cast of characters that can be found here and very often that are not really found in, in many other places. So I told you about the, the birds that come in threes. And I showed you a yellow chin spine tail earlier. So a bird that's found in scrub habitat, as opposed to wetland, like a yellow chin spine tail, is the pale breasted spine tail. Uh, we also have a greater annie to the left, to the right of that. Sorry, um, I got directionally confused there for a minute. Um, the greater annie is a huge bird. Um, and it is actually a member of the cuckoo family. Uh, and, by, and in contrast, the plain-breasted ground dove is one of the smallest doves on earth. And on the topic of doves, if you look really closely to the bird on the long-winged harrier on the extreme right, you would see that it is clutching um, an unfortunate ruddy ground dove, which is related to the plain-breasted, but it's a little bit larger. Still in central uh, Trinidad, um, we have we have two main sets of um, of man-made habitat. I say that um, that we that we go birding in, um, and that still retains a a certain level of biodiversity. And cocoa estates is one of them. I'll talk about the other one in a little bit. Um, but cocoa estates have uh, have have a lot of biodiversity um, due in no small um, part be, um, to the fact that there are large shade trees, right? And I should say the correct term for it, the term is cacao. Um, and for folks who have ever been to Trinidad and Tobago, I know at least two of you all have. Um, the chocolate here is, is is among the best in the world, right? I am very uh, particular with um, chocolate. I'm very particular with coffee. Um, and I can tell you, you, please take my word for it and have the, have the chocolate here. It is fabulous. Anyhow, um, in these uh, Cocoa Estates, you can find a really, really interesting um, selection of of uh, of birds and some of these actually are 
um, migrants from South America. So, you know, like some of these might seem familiar, but they might look a little bit different. So we have the Plumbeus kite, which is a beautiful, beautiful raptor, long pointed wings. And um, you can just see on the on the tips of the wings here, um, it is they actually have orange primaries, right? So it's a really interesting um, bird, and it's a really really um, easy way to to identify them if you see them soaring. Um, another migrant from South America is a fork-tailed flycatcher, and um, yeah, they 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 come here by the thousands um, every year. Um, on the right, extreme right, is the Guyanan trogon. And this Guyanan trogon is one of the three species of trogons that can be found in Trinidad and Tobago. On the extreme left is a black crested ant shrike. And guess what? It's one of three species of ant shrike. I wasn't kidding when I told you that good things come in threes. So the next kind of habitat that is um, that has something to do with um, humans is rice paddies, right? Um, and these are the, the these are the rice fields in the Caroni Plain. I told you about the Caroni Swamp, and um, this is just to the east of that swamp. Right, so these are the Caroni rice fields, and a lot, a lot of um, migrants pass through here from both the north and and the south. But we also have the, our fair share of resident birds within these. Right, so we have the unmistakable um, barn owl on the left, and just to the right of that is the striped cuckoo. Now, the striped cuckoo is our only cuckoo species that is a bird parasite, like the common cuckoo in the in the UK. And if you remember just a few slides ago, uh, we spoke about the pale-breasted spinetail. That is that bird is actually uh, one of the the favored host species of the striped cuckoo. And um, I don't want to get too much into it, but um, the striped cuckoo is one of those birds that lays different colored eggs for depending on the host that it's um that it's laying its eggs in. Well, the nest of the host that it's laying is you know what I mean. Uh, I'm I'm tying up myself, but um but yeah, it's it it can basically um, choose a color of 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 the eggs that it puts out um, based on the host that it's associated with. Um, this is this is due to like uh, females being particular to certain um, host species, and whereas males are not particular, so you have a female striped cuckoo that's particular to um, pale-breasted spine tails, and they would lay produce eggs according to that species. You may have a female striped cuckoo that may be particular to another species, like the house wren, and they would lay eggs. Um, mimicking um, the eggs of the house wren and so on. Anyhow, um, I don't want to get too distracted. You see, I wasn't kidding when I told you that I'll take the questions at the end of the chat, right? Uh, as at the end of the at the end of the talk, because I get distracted really easily. Anyhow, um, I, I was telling you that these uh, rice fields are full are full of migrants at the at the right time of year. And one of these is um, is the is the uh, what do you call it still sandpiper and what follows shorebirds are birds that eat shorebirds so the peregrine falcon is one of these and um, it's it's really I know you all would be familiar very familiar with the peregrine falcon black neck stilt and of course one of my favorites very very elegant and leggy birds so still in central trinidad and uh, so i'll tell you this photo was taken from the central range so that 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 middle mountain range um, that we spoke about northern range on the top 
central range in the middle, southern range at the bottom. So if you if you look really hard um, in the middle, just to the right of the banana leaves, um, there is a there is a tiny um, hill. That's a southern range. So we are right now on the central range, looking south, and there are, you know, there's there's a lot. I say a lot, but we're a tiny island, so relatively a lot um, of open, open low-lying uh, areas. And a lot of this is forested. And within this forest, we can find some really, really interesting species. Um, one of this on the on the left here is a Rufus broad pepper shrike, which is a bird that um, is far more often heard than seen. Um, Trinidad is also home to uh, the Channel Bill Toucan, which is uh, we're the only island in the Caribbean with a native population of toucans, um, which is again, you know, uh, that reminiscent that that recollection of our South American history. Um, for those of you who can see um, this, this really well on the right and the extreme right, I have a short-tailed hawk on a nest. And if you, can, if you can squint really hard, you can see the head of the baby right in the nest. He just popped up and this is his mom yelling at the, the, the male bird to bring some food and he arrived with uh, without food and uh, yeah she wasn't she wasn't too happy about that so moving on to eastern eastern trinidad and that coastline is literally pounded day in day out uh, night after night by the atlantic ocean and and this feeds um, the largest wetland on Trinidad, which is the Nariva Swamp. And we spoke about the Caroni Swamp in the west. This is the Nariva Swamp in the east. And you can see a really interesting juxtaposition of coconut trees, which are that beach habitat on the right. And on the left, it's giving way to mangrove, which is, you know, going further left, um, is going further inland um, into the Nariva Swamp which is heavily um, populated with mangrove trees. So some of the birds that can be found here range from the very large to the very little. In the very center of the screen, we have the American pygmy kingfisher, one of the smallest kingfishers. And on the extreme left, we have the mighty jabiru, which is one of the largest birds on the planet. And it is the tallest flying bird in the entire Western hemisphere. So that bird stands about five feet tall um i remember when uh when i i first saw that um this bird it's i i i literally thought it was a scarecrow because it was so huge and was right immediately next to the road i turned the corner and there it was and i had i thought it was a scarecrow i i legit thought that this cannot be a, a living thing and then it blinked and i was like wow this is incredible um uttered some obscenities, my camera was still put away in its bag and so on. Yeah, good times. Um, to the right of the Jabiru is an azure gallinule, um, which, uh, which is not a commonly seen um, bird. It is resident here, but um, you do need a sizable amount of luck um, to see an azure gallinule. Um, they're they typically love to remain hidden. Um, but yeah, I just I've I've only seen that bird twice, um, to be quite honest. Now, um, in eastern Trinidad, just a little bit um inland is one of the um one of the those wet savannas that I was telling you about when we had just started this um presentation. And um this is called the Aripo savanna, and it is literally the only that only remnant of the prehistoric habitat um, that that you know all of these animals used to used to roam within. And it is a wet savanna; the the soil it doesn't drain that um that quickly, so you know it is it's always it's always wet, and it's always um, 
it's it's full of a lot of you know some places you you can you can go into and it just feels ancient this is one of those places um there are on the ground you can find carnivorous plants like the sundew um and you know there are a lot of palms as well palm trees that are that are not found elsewhere it looks like something out of jurassic park to be honest and of course um another set of five incredible birds that middle bird is called a bat falcon and yes it does eat bats as the name implies um white bellied ant bird is a generally secretive bird but is fairly um, easy to find in this particular area the bird pictured there was a female but anyway as um i was telling you about some of the palm trees that are that are found here uh, there's a particular species called the marish palm and these are gigantic palm trees right um and they they occur in, in small groups and we call those palm marsh islands and um and these marish palms have been significant not only to the animals because many animals eat their fruit and many animals make nests in their um in their branches and even within, in dead trees um but also to the indigenous um, people that were here for for many hundreds of years uh you know so they used to make uh use the the the, the leaves to to make their their roofing uh, in their houses and they also used to make canoes out of the the trunks of these very large trees so here we can see uh, on our extreme left a pair of uh, red-bellied macaws and they are inspecting an old palm tree that they can they're probably wondering can we uh, raise our young in this this tree here um, the sulfury flycatcher to the right of the macaws um, is a is a unique flycatcher that's that's restricted to Maurice palm habitat. Um, the purple horny creeper on the right of that is guess what one of three species of honey creepers that we have here. Uh, on the extreme right is a is the mottled owl, which is one of our forest owls. Um, and it's it's very very secretive and it's also incredibly strictly nocturnal so you know some owls you can see it uh they they might be crepuscular they might be active at dawn and dusk um the mottled owl will sit and remain silent until it gets quite dark so um just a little bit to the to the north of the aripo savannas um, there's another area where um, we have agricultural pastures and they they support they support general generally a wide uh, wide variety of species this this particular area is called a repo livestock station and there's a, a breeding program for several species of cattle that are going on there and I personally have done um, the Christmas bird count at this location for several years now. And every year um, for our our CBC, I try to get 100 species for like the morning session for say from six in the morning until midday. And I've gotten to 99. So maybe this time I will get to 100. So we'll see, you know, fingers crossed. Um, some of the species that we can find here, uh, uh, on the left, we have a red-breasted meadowlark, and just to the to the right of that is a ruddy-breasted seed eater. Both are birds that um, that local people here call robin. Um, neither of them are actually robins, but you know that red and all reddish breast, um, they are unmistakable right they are very very charismatic birds and yeah any bird with a with a red breast is is a bird that attracts attention um the grassland yellow finch in the middle here um, is a bird that is generally restricted to this habitat and this particular location in the country 
and it is incredibly rare if not impossible to find them outside of this area um the silver beak tanager is is a is a common resident um and for those of you all who are photographers um the red the deep red on this silver beak tanager this is a male of the species it is it is a lot of stress to to render properly and for your camera sensor to see this red it's 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 a physics issue let's just leave it at that um anyway on to the northwest so we we're, we're at the top of trinidad now and i hope we're doing okay on time um and i hope i'm not boring you with uh with copious pictures of birds i'm sure not um because that's what we're here for anyhow um so remember the map northwest trinidad now so we are the we are the top of trinidad and we're going on to the left side so that northwest area um there's been a lot of um bamboo forest in the northwest right and that's kind of like that that's been permeating the the, the tropical rainforest that was historically there bamboo of course is invasive here as with uh, most other places other than uh, southeast asia um so yeah some of the birds that can be found here um include some none of these birds really are bamboo specialists per se but they all have adapted um fairly well to the kind of habitat and can easily be found in this north uh north west um section of trinidad um this the golden crowned warbler as you see here is one of the three resident species of warbler um the mast yellow throat being the other one that we spoke about um on the right is the green backed trogon which is the largest species of trogon that can be found um in trinidad and tobago and this one here pictured is a male really really beautiful bird as all of them are right now further west from this um there are a few islands and these islands are called the bocas islands and uh, the reason why they're called the bocas islands is because they are they're across uh, a passage of water um called bocas del dragon or the dragon's mouth um so yeah they're called they're called bocas the bocas islands and this this particular one is the the westernmost one so just beyond this is the the paria peninsula of venezuela and the body of water on the left of this picture is the gulf of paria and the body of water in the middle is actually a salt pond um i was looking for flamingos in the salt pond but sadly there were none at this point in time right an interesting fact about the bocas islands is that geologically they bear a closer relation to tobago than to mainland trinidad and not only do they bear a closer relation to tobago they also are closely related to the abc islands um the abc islands are aruba bonaire and curacao uh, and that's a little bit further um further west of us and those islands coupled with the bocas islands as well as tobago they're actually geologically all closer related to they came from panama as far as i as i am aware um whereas the island of trinidad was more from that south american mainland so yeah it's it's interesting how um geologically how um actions over millennia can have um these knockdown impacts on on people like you and me who are looking at birds and wondering wow look at these birds that are found here but not on somewhere else so several of these birds that that you see here most notably uh the white fringed antren and the black-faced grass squid are found on the bocas islands but not on 
mainland Trinidad. However, both the white fringed anteran and the black faced grass squid are found on Tobago. So that's an interesting um, point of view to corroborate the geological history story that I just told you. And yeah, so let's scoot across to the northeast of Trinidad. And the northeast of Trinidad, um, there are, yes, there are lots of rivers here. And, um, but these rivers are different from the rivers that are found elsewhere on the island because these are heavily forested rivers and these do not have mangroves. Um, you know, they don't empty into mangrove swamps. They are forest streams and they just grow into rivers and eventually empty into the open ocean. And in Northeast, to be, Northeast Trinidad, sorry, um, there are some really interesting birds that can be found here. And on this slide, we have our first of two endemic species, and this being the Trinidad piping guan, which is, which is actually critically endangered and uh, only found in the forests of Northeast Trinidad. Um, I think I think the population of this bird is anywhere between um, seventy to three hundred birds. Another of my neighbors just showed up a little cane toad. I haven't seen one of these for several weeks, so that's interesting. Um, the white bearded mannequin that's next to the Trinidad piping guan is uh, one of three species of mannequin. And next to that is a common potu. We only have one species of potu here, and they are, as all other um, potus, incredibly difficult to locate if they are um, roosting during the day and you want to see them. Um, you need to either know where one is roosting or be incredibly lucky. Still in Northeast Trinidad, we can find some of the, the highest peaks um, on the island and in the country in general. Uh, when I say highest peaks, they're not really um, mountain level high, like probably what you guys are used to. But... Um, our highest peaks are just under 1,000 1, meters above sea level, which is, you know, 3,000 feet, something like that. Um, but nevertheless, still high enough to get some, um, some level of cloud forest, right? And within this cloud forest, there are several species of birds that are not found anywhere else. Um, most notably, um, the orange bill nightingale thrush. Um, speckled tanager, as well as the blue-capped tanager. These are birds that are restricted to their highest elevations and um, are unfortunately some of the, the most susceptible to climate change. Um, as as the, the climate is changing, the suitable habitat for these birds is shrinking as the, the cloud forest is gradually disappearing. Of course, that this these are uh, forested areas are where you find some of the more uh, spectacularly colored birds, right? Um, so most throughout um, the northern range, uh, for the most part, we have a lot of mature tropical rainforest, um, both lower mountain as well as upper mountain, and yeah, we get some really really fantastic um, birds up in these these hills here. Um, on the very left is the largest predatory bird that can be found in Trinidad and Tobago. That is a black hawk eagle. Um, and just to the right of that is the largest owl that we have here, the spectacle owl. And also here to the extreme right is the, the only Kotinga species that we have, which is a bearded bellbird, one of the loudest birds um, on the planet. I would have embedded the call, but then I would have to embed some other calls because, you know, once you do one, you have to do something else. Um, and then we'll be here for three hours. So still in Northeast Trinidad, there is a, there is this, there is a road. Um, you know, I talk, I spoke about Panama. And if anyone has been building in Panama, there is this very famous pipeline road um, on Trinidad. We have this uh, the Arima Blanche Shares Road, uh, and that has um, the most impressive altitude profile 
of any road on the island and it is one of the best roads um, to go breeding along and some of the birds that you can see um, while taking this road uh, include some maybe a little bit secretive some uh, a little bit less secretive right um, the we had some of some of these are uh, migrants as well so the summer tanager is a migrant um, this one pictured here is an immature bird as you can see it's not entirely red yet um, the black faced ant thrush on the on the extreme right is a fairly secretive resident um, of the forest here they love the forest floor they like to go and just walk around and flip leaves and see what's under the leaves um, and the golden-headed mannequin that you see in the middle there is um, is the smallest species of mannequin that we get out of the three. And they are, yes, like all mannequins, they dance. They dance a lot. Um, so one of the one of the attractions here is to come and see them um, do their dances on the branches. That was an unintentional rhyme, which is the best kind. Um, Northeast Trinidad, still. Um, because it is fairly extensive. Remember, we have uh, almost 500 species here, and this is a, really a result of the different, the many different habitats that we have. And one of these is littoral vegetation, which are like, um, as you can see here, we got sea grape and almond and uh, a bunch of these other trees that have very, um, the leaves are very thick and very resistant to the to salt water. Um, so. A lot of the birds that are found here, they they they, they may feed on the, the fruits of the sea grape. Um, they may roost in some of these trees, but also there is a fair amount of forest habitat that just um that just falls off straight directly into the ocean. All right. We have common ground dove, which is actually an uncommon site. Uh, one of the one of the smaller dove species that we have here, uh, one of the smallest doves in the world. I believe that the common ground dove is the smallest dove in North America. Uh, you can someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I spoke about cuckoos earlier. Um, we have the squirrel cuckoo, which is not in fact a brood parasite. They raise their own young, but it is a spectacular bird. It is it is large and it is it is named after a squirrel. Um, not only because it has a very long tail, but because of how it how it um, it's it's locomotion, right? They love to go on a they love to run and just like hop from branch to branch in these large trees, and at first glance they do look like squirrels. Um, and we get broad winged hawks here, which are um, we have a migrant population of broad winged hawks as well as a resident population um, and they they of course migrate in huge um, kettles so those of y'all who look at hawk migration yeah they they pass through here um, every year anyhow that's it for Trinidad and we are on to southwest Tobago and southwest Tobago is the, the only part uh, really and truly where you'll find um, substantial mangrove habitat on the island of Tobago. And some of the some of the best wetland viewing um, water bird or waterfowl viewing can be had in the southwest of Tobago. And we have, of course, a mix of migrants as well as um, resident birds. So we have breeding residents such as the white cheek pintail, uh, least grebe. Least grebe, I think, believe is one of the smallest grebes in the in the world, if not the smallest. Um, and we do get great blue herons here um, all year round. But of course, during the northern winter, numbers are supplemented by migrants coming in to escape the cold in the north. Um, still in southwest Tobago, there is also a lot of lowland scrub vegetation and dry forest. So here we have a picture of a, this is actually a swamp, but there's also, um, so in the middle there, there's, it's, it is waterlogged, a lot of dragonflies and so on. And 
but there is also a lot of um, this dry forest vegetation. Um, so as a result, uh, it still it still um, supports a fairly uh, wide variety of bird life. Um, so one of these, uh, which is a bird exactly in the middle, the probably the absolute most nondescript bird uh, in this presentation, uh, it is the scrub greenlet, which is uh, it, it is an endemic um, subspecies to the island of Tobago, and some have already started calling it the Tobago greenlet. So it might be a matter of time. I may have to change this presentation. Um, but yeah, be forewarned that the scrub greenlet may eventually become um, the third endemic species on Trinidad and Tobago, which would be the Tobago greenlet. Um, Yellow-billed cuckoo, I think many of you would be familiar with yellow-billed cuckoo. And um, yeah, the brown-crested flycatcher is another fairly common um, species of flycatcher that is found here. I haven't included many flycatchers in this presentation, but it doesn't mean that I don't like them. Um, Central Tobago, I told you about the main ridge forest. The main ridge uh, is that, that um, this the only mountain range on Tobago. It doesn't get that high. It's only about 600 or 600, a little bit above 600 meters above sea level. Um, but there is something really special about it because it has been protected since 1776. It is the oldest legally protected tropical rainforest in the entire Western Hemisphere and uh, uh, also the, the oldest legally protected tropical rainforest um, in the world. There are other protected forests um, in other parts of the world, but this is the oldest legally protected tropical rainforest. And it has been protected um, since since that time because Tobago um, has been filled with various um, estates. Um, Tobago is a listen. Tobago is one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and it has changed hands. It has changed colonial hands for um, I think thirty two times. So from the English to the Dutch to the French to the Spanish or whoever. Um, yeah, people have been fighting over this tiny island for a very, very long time. Um, so it's, I guess, it's one of these places that you have to come to to experience, right? Anyhow, um, because there were so many estates um, present, um, the authorities at the time decided, listen, the main ridge is so important as a watershed. We need to we need to protect this and preserve it because. Um, this is how all of the estates get their water supply. And it remains so to this day. It could be bright, hot, and sunny elsewhere. But once you head up into that mountain, it's nice and cool and rainy. So anyway, back to the birds. Um, the great black hawk is the largest um, bird of prey on Tobago. Um, and the blue-backed mannequin is the only species of mannequin on Tobago. The third species of mannequin that we have spoken about, and also the largest mannequin that is found in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, an interesting uh, note about the other these two little um, russet-colored birds, a gray-throated leaf tosser and the striped-breasted spinetail. They are both birds that inhabit similar um, habitat. They inhabit this this forest. They they both are birds that inhabit the forest floor. And they have similar habits as well as being similarly colored. So yeah, keep keep your eyes out and um, make sure you know which one is which because they are fairly, fairly difficult to tell apart at a glance. So um, this forest of Main Ridge has a lot of palm trees as well as a lot of ferns. And there's a reason for this because palms are very fast growing trees. And in 1963, there was a really bad hurricane here called Hurricane Flora. And that, that you know, that leveled a lot of the trees um, in the main ridge uh, forest. 
and taking advantage of the space in the canopy, palm trees shot up, um, as we like to say in Trinidad and Tobago, they shot up left, right, and center, meaning everywhere. So um, it's it, it, it has formed an interesting mix of habitat, right? And uh, one of the birds that, that suffered a lot in um, that hurricane was a white-tailed sable wing, which is this very large and absolutely gorgeous hummingbird, which I would say is my favorite hummingbird species on the islands. Um, this species of hummingbird was not seen for 11 years following the hurricane, but has since made a comeback. Um, to the right of that is a striped owl, which is uh, a subspecies of striped owl that's endemic to Tobago. And some people, I'm not sure if that if it was extinct because it's it's hardly ever seen, um, but yeah, it's it's a very um, it's it's a very very beautiful owl, and it's one of the few um, species of owl that can be found on Tobago. the The other um, owl is the barn owl, which we spoke about before. It's also found in Trinidad as well as all over the world, right? But the striped owl is really really special, and this was my one and only um, opportunity to photograph this bird back in March of this year. Um, to the extreme right is a, is is a, is an olivaceous wood creeper, which is another bird that's unique to Tobago. Um, it is the smallest wood creeper we have uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's so tiny, and it's colored in this way that um, when it's hopping up the trunks of trees, it looks like a, a little mouse. So it's just another another reason to keep your eyes out in the forest. Heading further further into the northeast, um, we reach some of the the more picturesque locations, and um, this area is more or less dominated by seasonal forest. And we don't have uh, four seasons here. We have a uh, here we have wet season and dry season. It's simple, um, but. By seasonal forest, I mean trees that shed their leaves and then grow back their leaves based on the weather. And here we have uh, one of the, the other um, endemic species. So Trinidad Mot Mot on the extreme left is, um, is endemic to the islands of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is actually um, the only endemic bird that is endemic to the islands of Trinidad and the Tobago. The other one that we spoke about before, the Trinidad piping guan is only found on Trinidad. So this mot mot is found on both Trinidad and Tobago. Um, next to that is a rufous vented shashalaka. And you might, you might count yourselves lucky for having this presentation being done at night um, because in the daytime, they would be awake and making a lot of that shashalaka noise. Um, Actually, they do it sometimes at night. Um, if something disturbs a flock uh, that's roosting, they would start a call. So maybe if we're lucky, we'll hear some shashalakas before we um before we end this. Um, next to that, of course, is the resplendent-looking ruby topaz hummingbird, which is a a target for many people who visit. And these birds actually um they can look just like this with the red and the yellow. Um, this is a male. But he can also look at you and look completely brown. Um, so you have to catch him of in the in the right uh, light. Of course, these um these feathers on their on their crown and gorget and everything they are they have a crystalline structure, right? So it all depends on how they hold their feathers. And this little guy's throat can also be green um, in some in some uh, light. Anyway, heading further into the northeast. So if we're picturing it, remember the map, guys. That map, we're almost at the end of it. And we're almost on the tip of Tobago, right? And right now we're looking northward into, into the ocean, right? So these, these uh, islands off of the coast of northeast Tobago, um, they, they are very, very rocky. 
they're very, very dry. And as a result, they have a lot of succulents and other plants that are um, suitably adapted to such a dry um, habitat. And if any of you have ever been to any of the ABC islands, Aruba, Bonaire, or Curaçao, um, it looks very much just like this, right? And some of the birds that are found here, um, many of them are actually not resident, but they come here to breed. Um, so very, various species of seabirds, such as the red bird, tropic bird, and sooty tern, uh, they come here um, every year. To, to lay their eggs and to raise their young. Um, both of these, the tropic bird and the sooty tern, um, were photographed whilst um, breeding. And they're not really accustomed to humans. So, you know, they, they don't, um, they, they will walk, or I, I say walk loosely because their, their legs are so not uh, well adapted to walking on ground. They could just kind of hop. Um, they will go right past you. Um, on the on the extreme right is the white-tailed niger, which is the only niger species that's found on Tobago, and the smallest species of niger that's found on Trinidad and Tobago. And if you look at my video behind me, there's a little perch there. Sometimes one would come and sit there. Um, I don't know if any of them um, have while I've been talking because I didn't look. But if you did see any movement there, it was probably a white-tailed niger. And further um, afield um, and further into the ocean, we have some other um, offshore islets. And these islets are called the islets of St. Giles. And they are officially protected and uh, no, one, no one is allowed to enter to, to make landfall on these islands. And as you can see here, the coast of these islands is very, very inhospitable and not really friendly for a boat landing. And you get some other um, seabird species um, that, that breed on these islands, right? Um, bridal tern on the left, brown noddy, red-footed booby, which is the smallest booby in the world, um, and as well as the magnificent frigate bird. And this frigate bird is, is, is the largest frigate bird on the planet, and it terrorizes the other seabirds because, remember, they are... Um, they, they feed via kleptoparasitism, right? Whereby they steal food from other seabirds. Um, they eat fish, of course, and squid and so on, but they can't get their feathers wet, so they have to pick it off the surface or steal it from other birds. Um, but the islands of St. Giles form a very important breeding ground for this species. Um, and they can be found here in, in really great number. On the extreme right, you might find it a little bit weird that I have a pigeon. Um, this is this is a scaly naped pigeon, and it is a recent, a fairly recent addition to our um, bird bird life here. Um, in 2004, there was a really a really big uh, bad hurricane called Hurricane Ivan. Uh, in 2004, 2005, and um, it 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 destroyed a lot of habitat further up the islands. And since then, they've they've kind of drifted south, and they started to colonize some of the. The offshore islands off of uh, of Tobago. Anyhow, um, after this point, um, we have we have uh, come to the end of uh, our tour, and uh, all that's left is going on to the open ocean. Beyond here is the continental shelf, and there are several species of seabirds that pass through here, and uh, many of them, I'm sure, um, go unobserved. Um, because this is just a pure Atlantic and um, not many people go birding beyond this point. But we're looking to change that um, in the future. Anyway, um, just just a, a couple of concerns if, if um, some of you might be thinking about when is the best time to visit, because obviously after seeing this presentation and seeing all these wonderful birds, you might be thinking, hey, well, I want to come and check out some of these birds, right? So if you are planning uh, your trip, uh, think about what is it that you want to see. And some of them can be seen um, all year. Some of them are only visible at a certain time. And some, of, some, some months of the year, you might see migrants from the north. Other times, you might see migrants from the south. And during some weeks, 
you can see migrants from the both North and South America in the same place. So that'll be pretty remarkable, right? And um, just some, some points to consider, right? Uh, when you're planning a trip, there, there are two islands, so you can't just you, you can't just come to one and then just um, you know drive across to another. We we don't have a, a land-based connection, right? So it's either by boat or by plane, right? We have several building lodges on the islands, and um, you know, make sure and book a guide because while it is possible to see many of these birds on your own, um, it is very important to to be with a with a local, especially. Um, if you are considering safety, right? Um, we have four venomous snakes on the island of Trinidad, none on Tobago. Um, also consider things like crime, um, heat, and uh, insect bites, right? So these are just some of the things that you can um, think about. Um, of course, if you're planning a trip, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and, and yeah. And um, thank you very much. You can find me on social media or my website on the bottom there, just for Az Abdul, or you can come see me in this river. So if you look hard, you're probably going to see me um, just waving to you here at the bottom. So yeah, with that, I have come to the end of uh, my presentation and I'll stop the share. And... Yeah, thanks so much. Outstanding presentation. I, I mean, looking at, I, I started shopping for flights as you were talking. It was so cool. <laughs> um, I'm gonna hand over to, I'm gonna hand over to Alicia. Alicia, um, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Fraz. That was an amazing presentation, and we do have some questions. Um, can you please comment a bit more about the endemic species and if there are any strict regulations? in place to protect them. Um, in particular, the boat built Karen was a favorite um, and um, it was noted that they also have them um, in Honduras, um, especially along the North Coast. So if you wanna say, share a little more about the boat built Karen and um, any protections that you might note about any of the endemic species. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, definitely there are so one of the endemic species uh, is, is the Trinidad piping one, which is critically endangered. And it is officially protected and there are hefty fines that, are, that go along with, um, with anyone who hunts them. Um, the reason why they are critically endangered is because they have been hunted um, in the past. And, um, and they are, yeah, so, because of the the regulations that are in place, um, they have been they have been uh, increasing in in population recently. Um, regarding the other endemic species, the the Trinidad motmot, they still are fairly common. Uh, so there are no no um, no regulations in place at the point in time, and um, and yeah, the 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 boat bill heron is one of my favorite my favorite birds as well um it's like our new tropical version of the shoebill right um and they they are they're really really incredible species they are mostly nocturnal as um as as you would know if you're familiar with them um and they are unfortunately um they have been hunted in the past no it is it is illegal to hunt any form of uh, of of any birds in this country um but of course enforcement uh remains uh, there's a lot to be desired um so but yeah the the boat bill heron is something that that is that is possible to see but because of um previous hunting pressure on the species um it remains quite secretive um and they love to roost in these really really tangled um uh, areas and fairly inaccessible spaces as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, would is there anything you would um, say about the best time of year to observe birds in these areas that we covered? Yeah, I would say that um, if 
if I were to choose one one uh, time in the year, it would be April, because in April we still have some of the northern migrants um before they leave um you know like some species like um like red knots we get red knots here and they would be molting into their their breeding plumage because they molt into their breeding plumage and then they fly north um so they you know you'd get them with that brick red breast and so on you'd also still get some of the migratory warblers um before they head north and you'd also get migrants from the south that are coming up so you would get species like the fork-tailed flycatcher coming in, plumbeus kite, swallow tanager, which I did not include in this presentation, but is a, it is a fantastically colored bird. Uh, it's like it's got white on the belly. It's it's got a black mask, and the rest of the body is turquoise. It is ridiculous. Um, and further to the migrants, um, in April, a lot of the resident birds are in courtship, so they're just before their breeding season and they are but they're 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 in that courtship mode so they're like in their best dress they're doing all of their moves for their for their mates and um you know it's it's really really interesting to see the activity is really high in the forest at that point in time as well so yeah i'd recommend april if i were to choose um one one time of year that's that's the best time awesome so april it is everyone um yeah Let's book your flights. Um, okay, yeah. so um, I did want to ask, um, is there anything in particular that you would note about um, the effects of agriculture on birds and bird habitat? Um, or is there maybe any any programs you know of um, that are bird friendly um, or anything you want to say about agriculture in the area? Yeah, um, we we do have a, a problem with, uh, with, with agriculture because there's a lot of slash and burn. That's been going on, especially um, since COVID. You know, a lot of people have taken to doing home gardening and so on, which is fine. Um, but then there's a lot of chemical use and in terms of pesticides and and so on. And there is, there are a lot of um, avenues for for education that um, that you know we can communicate to the public about the. The, knock, the the runoff uh, involved in pesticide use and just general chemical use. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of it has affected birds, especially the migratory shorebirds that come and they feed in. They love uh, farmland and it's a, a big part of the reason why they love farmland is because the farmland, a lot of that farmland was formerly swamp and um, habitat that the shorebirds would have been using for hundreds of years um so they come here and you know there's a field that's been recently sprayed and they feed in it and sometimes sometimes we find dead shorebirds and it's it's really heartbreaking um and you know like i've i've tried to to petition um clinics to do some necropsies and so on but it's it's difficult to get um to get buy-in basically from from some people and some organizations to to help in in communicating certain messages um but yeah there is there is still a lot of a lot of work to be done um we are trying to work with some farmers to you know to to show that we you know if if you are if if you are farming in an area that is ecologically healthy, your crops are going to be better. Um, but it's 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 a, an uphill climb. But we're trying. Yeah, we we try. I I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat um, or. Um, yeah, just let me know. And while I have you still, um, I'll go ahead and just ask uh, my favorite fun question, which um, I know you can't pick one favorite, but is there a plover that you've gotten to see during migration that really excited you that you would want to share more about? I, I think that um, in terms of, uh, of, of plovers that um, we, today I saw an American golden plover, by the way, while I was driving. And I and I slammed the brakes 
and our reviewers then looked at it and took a little video and so on. Um, but you know, if 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 I were to pick a favorite plover, it would be a, a three-banded plover, which is not something that's found here, but it's found in um in in some of the African countries. Um and I think that you know it's it's got uh it's got the bands on its on its on its breast area and it's got a really nice red eye ring. And it's a, it's another tiny one. I know you love the tiny plovers, Alicia. I do. I can't help it. And I would have crashed my car if I saw that golden clover today. Um, yep. So I'm glad you were able to hit your brakes. Um, <laughs> thank you for sharing. Um, and lots of thank yous and appreciation for the presentation. Did anyone else on the line have a question? Um. Let me see. Oh, I'm seeing a question here. Could it be said that the main ridge on Tobago is an extension of the northern range on Trinidad? Um, I'm not sure. From what I understand, they are geologically separate. Um, but I might have to just double check that and get back to you. Let me see. Um, the Aplomado falcon, I've seen a question on the Aplomado falcon as well, um, that they they do, they migrate to here. So generally they, they show up for just a couple months and then they tend to move off when the peregrines arrive just a few months later. So they are in the in the in the palm forest, in the in the coconut palms. They love, they love that area. Um but they're also, you know, they can also be found on the rice paddies, um, hunting shorebirds and the mud flats and and so on. But once the bigger peregrines arrive, they they muscle them out of, of here. I also want to thank everyone for coming. Um, it's it's been nice to to present here and see familiar faces and, and see some familiar names. Okay. Yeah, I thought, thank you very much. I mean, I thought it was a, an amazing. I do have one one last question, mm -hmm. and I don't want it to. I want to. So we all, both of us, um, our areas are really close to the coastline, um, and we're seeing here effects from sea level rise and climate change. Um, have Have you seen what's been going on in your country as far as? The effects of sea level rise and climate change on and in in your area and especially in, in terms of bird habitat and is is there anything going on to help um, protect these areas or is there a, a more of an armoring the coast mentality where they want to put seawalls up? Um, well, we honestly I haven't been seeing a lot of um, effects of sea level rise here because uh, a lot of our coastlines are very steep. Um, and oh, sorry, I just kicked my water bottle down. Um, but worse things have happened. Um, but yeah, so what we're seeing in terms of climate change is um, is 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 habitat change. So especially in some of the the higher elevation areas, we're seeing areas that um, that historically have been let's just say populated by ferns. And now they are no longer ferns there, but there are grasses there, right? So there are certain aspects of the higher elevation um, habitats that are changing. Um, and the birds are also um, changing their habits as well. So I, I, I mentioned a, a species called a blue-capped tanager, which is one that is restricted to the higher elevation areas. Um, that has been um, it in 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 the past. It has been noted nesting at a far lower elevation than what you can see that bird at now. So you know they're 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 having they're they're being forced to kind of like move higher and higher up the mountain based on how the climate has been changing. Something else that's been going on here in terms of climate change has been um, uh, a heavier influx of sargassum uh, seaweed. That's one thing, and another thing is that um, every year there's been a a rhythm of 
trees uh, putting flowers out and um, then when the trees put their flowers out, then that kind of filters down into the activities of the birds. They go into nesting and they everything is timed, right? Um, but what we found in recent years is that some trees flower more than once a year. And, you know, the rhythm of, of the forest seems a little bit off. Um, and as a result, you know, the, the birds have been getting a little bit frantic and some of them have been forced to, well, okay, well, well, this tree is flowering now, so hey, we better we better get our nest um, going. And then, you know, they raise a young and before you know it, the tree is in flower again. And then they have to start doing the same thing all over again. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been fairly unsettling to see um the some of the like the different effects of climate change outside of sea level um uh, rise here and these are not really well um documented in a in a sense of um how like the amount of press that sea level rise has been getting um so there's a lot of a lot more work to that must go into you know communicating this message to the authorities Yeah, we we hear your message. I mean, certainly it's it's a it's a huge problem for us too. Um, so there's a couple of more questions, and I think then we'll wrap it up. Um, so one question was, which family was the gray hair Annie from? Um, they're from the cuckoo family. Okay, and then the final question for tonight is: Are there do you guys are you guys getting um, avian malaria or avian pox that apparently is uh, becoming fairly large problems in Hawaii. Yeah, not not to my knowledge. Um, what we get sometimes, uh, what I've seen is um, a, that a viral infection um, that gives birds the, like, it makes their bill soft. It affects the keratin and you get the, the upper mandible just kind of lopping over the lower one. And as, as far as I know, it's a, it's a virus, but, um, but I'm not sure. I can't remember the name of it. But I haven't seen anything um, about avian malaria or avian pox. All right. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for, for coming out. I, this is one of the a really excellent presentation. Um, I speak on behalf of the membership and everybody who attended that. I think it was an excellent, excellent show. And we, thank, we can't thank you enough. Um, thank I'll you. Alicia for um, um, some finals. And uh, again, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, hope to see you guys on the next field trip on Saturday at uh, Camino Real Park. And we'll see you next month at the next Zoom meeting. Um, hang around. Uh, Roz and we'll, uh, we'll sign off uh, after the first time. Thanks a lot for Roz. Thanks, Helen. Pat, good to see you all. <laughs> Me too. We miss you. <laughs> yeah, we miss you all too. <laughs> Hope to see you all again soon.